BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And just a quick reminder every Monday is Zodiac Mondays. Wednesday is an Ask Me Anything. That's an AMA, so please drop your questions below for things that you would like discussed here on the show. And Friday is an Anything Goes. Any subject is fair game, mostly talking about true crime, serial killers, the Zodiac Killer, but any subject is welcome. All right, so please share some ideas in the comment section about what you would like to hear about on this channel, and let's get started. Okay, hello everybody. Today is Friday. Another Anything Goes Friday. Welcome to the show. Today is when any subject is fair game, and we are once again going back to 1888 to revisit the mystery of Jack the Ripper. But before we begin, I would just like to remind you guys that you can download the show for free at Launchpad 1. There's a link to that in the description box. That is the audio version as a pure podcast. Take it on the go, anywhere and anyhow. If you would like to download the video version, you can use YouTube Premium, but that you have to pay for. Launchpad 1 is free. Another great way to support the show, in addition to just listening, liking, and subscribing, is to visit the Amazon page, which has a copy of the book Killer on a White Horse by me, Ned Dahan. And if you're using a Kindle e-reader or tablet, you can even get a free sample of that, Killer on a White Horse by Ned Dahan, available on Amazon.com. And of course, there's always the Teespring page. Feel free to have a look at some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Now, every Monday on the channel, I talk about the Zodiac Killer, and I did a book response to the book The Myth of the Zodiac Killer last year, and there was one page in there that talks about Jack the Ripper. It talks about how the letters that were written in 1888, allegedly from the Ripper, were frequently and commonly accepted as hoaxes. And I was like, oh yeah, is that really true? And I just got on Google.com and I put in Jack the Ripper. And one of the first articles that came up was something from the BBC that said the letters from Jack the Ripper are commonly considered hoaxes. As we're going to see today, not everyone is in agreement with that. And I'm going to be citing the websites jacktheripper.org and whitechapeljack.com a lot throughout this. I think it was um, on Whitechapel Jack where it was reported that there are as many as 700 pieces of writing that were allegedly connected to Jack the Ripper. So you can imagine a lot of them are probably not authentic. But are there any letters that were mailed in by Jack the Ripper that could actually be from a person who committed a series of murders in the summer and fall of 1888? So first, I want to say, this Jack the Ripper hoax theory, it's not my own invention. I didn't come up with it. I don't subscribe to it. I don't endorse it. But let's lay out a case for the letters that have been attributed to Jack the Ripper being a hoax. Firstly, who would be behind it? The newspapers of the time. One of the pieces of evidence that supports this is that a journalist named Fred Best confessed to writing the Dear Boss letter and the Saucy Jack postcard in 1931. And uh, according to one source here that we'll go through later on, it states that that, was, that confession wasn't uncovered until about 30 years afterwards and that people learned that somebody had confessed to it. But not everyone accepts it as a genuine confession. But one thing I did notice is on these Jack the Ripper sites, there's actually somewhat of a, a sense of openness in regards to the Jack the Ripper hoax theory. Some people are, are like, yeah, it's quite pro probable that these letters were a hoax, but that's just the pieces of writing. Well, were real people murdered? Yes, absolutely. And one of the reasons I'm t why I'm talking about this is because we are now in the month of August. And I'm hoping to do some memorials and tributes for the victims of Jack the Ripper throughout the year. But I also felt that I was going to originally call this episode The Murder of Polly Nichols. 
nickname for the first victim in the canonical crimes. But instead, I decided that I was going to take a page from Brian Davis, the host of the Tate LaBianca radio program, and just use the anniversary dates of the Ripper victims as a day of mourning, where instead of talking about the aspects of the case, just let the victims truly rest in peace. So hopefully that'll happen this year. And instead, I wanted to discuss this theory because certain things caught my attention. Firstly, who committed the murders? The Ripper hoax theory suggests that there were gangs operating on the streets of London in 1888. There were people who are attacking women regularly, and also there was a very intense wave of poverty going through England in 1888. And many women turned to sex work, and these gangs would corner sex workers in secluded places, in vulnerable places, and they would try to blackmail them. And when sources talk about using the word blackmail, I can only understand that they are proposing bribes, extortion, something to do with some type of exchange going on. And if the woman would not agree to that, then she was murdered. And not only was she murdered, she was also mutilated to drive fear into the local communities or just to give people the understanding that there is this type of um, dreadful presence lurking around. Now, one of the other pieces of evidence to support the Jack the Ripper hoax theory comes before the canonical five victims. Five canonical victims, can you believe that? And this deals with the murder of Emma Elizabeth Smith, which occurred on April 3rd of 1888. And allow me to read something from whitechapeljack.com. The first victim in the series of Whitechapel murders was a prostitute by the name of Emma Elizabeth Smith, who was attacked and raped on Osborne Street in Whitechapel on April 3, 1888. During the assault, her attackers beat and raped her and then violently inserted a blunt object into her vagina, causing an injury which would take her life the following day. After the assault, the men emptied her purse and fled. Now, some people think that that was an authentic or a genuine case of Ripper activity, but as you heard there, there are multiple assailants. I think I read on the other major site, Jack the Ripper, that Emma wasn't even completely sure how many people attacked her, but there were multiple men, and it goes to show you that people are doing very vicious things to women who are in vulnerable places. So, these types of crimes are happening. Another point that would support the hoax theory is that two seasons like August to November of 19, of 1888, excuse me, that is a very small reign of terror for a serial killer. Absolutely, that is a short time frame. Many serial killers operate over a multi-year basis. But when you have something like that, well, think about what the confession from Fred Best said, that he authored the Dear Boss letter and the Saucy Jack postcard because it was involved with an effort of keeping the newspaper business alive. It was about creating this type of newspaper tabloid sensation, which would get the attention of many people. They're going to be buying more papers. It was um, a case of genuine fake news. They're using an outrageous story to attract many people. Like if they just say that, well, gangs are going around trying to blackmail sex workers, well, that's not necessarily going to sell lots of newspapers, but to create this image of Jack the Ripper, then that perhaps would sell newspapers. Another point that supports the Jack the Ripper hoax theory goes ahead after the murder of Polly Nichols and on to the murder of the third and fourth victims, Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes. They were both murdered on the same night, which is referred to as the double event. And it really, it's the murder of Long Liz Stride, whom I have an episode about here on this channel, if anyone would like to hear about this. Now, she was a victim from the Ripper, who was not mutilated. She, her throat was slashed, but her body was not cut apart. And I am 90% sure that Elizabeth Stride was not murdered by Jack the Ripper. That does not mean zero. 
I mean, there's a 10% chance that she was. And the reason why I say this is because of the way that the crime has been narrated and the way that the timeline has been shared with us. There are these sightings of a man who is spending hours following Elizabeth's stride up and down the street for a very long period of time because we don't even need to put a number on it. He's spending countless amounts of time with Liz Stride, trying to get her to go somewhere. It's possible she even bought grapes from somebody when she's with this man. And then she ends up murdered. And that somebody was trying to commit this crime in a courtyard, and maybe some witnesses walked in and the perpetrator got spooked, so he hid for a while and waited for them to leave and then got out. Well... Less than one hour later, Catherine Eddowes is murdered, and she's mutilated. Her body is torn to shreds. It's possible that half of her kidney was even stolen and then transported to another place. That isn't even completely accepted. I just don't believe that someone would have spent that much time with Elizabeth Stride only to um, have the mutilation interrupted, so then they're just going to go after another victim within as little as 15 minutes. I think that that's too small of a time window. It's possible. Crazier things have happened, but I do not believe that Elizabeth Stride was a genuine victim of Jack the Ripper. And I, she is also the only victim to have been found south of Whitechapel Road. I hope I got that correctly. And all you Ripperologists out there can correct me any time I get something wrong. Okay, but we've talked about two things. Number one is the journalist's confession in 1931. And number two is the Gangs of London. We've um, talked about an alternative group of suspects and someone who is writing the letters. How would you put them together? How could you reconcile that and actually turn that into a hoax? Well, very simply, the journalists who were working with the newspapers, maybe the Star, for example, are going to be working with the gangs, following along just... um in agreement for not ratting anybody out. If, if anything, it would work to the gang's advantage because this Jack the Ripper, this boogeyman figure, is going to get blamed for it and not them. That would absolutely work to their advantage. And let's let's just have a quick reminder. This is a theory. It is not an established fact that Jack the Ripper was a hoax and there was no Jack the Ripper. But I was reading a very um, interesting book today that was just online for free via Google Books, and it was called The Murder Stories. And it was talking about how the image of Jack the Ripper really evolved over the years. By the time you get to the 1920s, you had lots of supernatural depictions of Jack the Ripper, almost like a phantom or a ghoul. And then by the 1960s, you had the media depicting Jack the Ripper as an aristocrat, and someone who is wearing a top hat and perhaps a member of high society who is preying on women. And you will see that even to this day. I think there are a couple reasons for that. For starters, um, I think it, it was Jerry B. who shared this in the comments section on the episode about Long Liz Stride. And that is, one theory is that the final victim in the Jack the Ripper mystery was Mary Kelly, who was absolutely mutilated beyond recognition. And uh, I think Super Strike 9 said the photo of the Mary Kelly crime scene is one of the most gruesome things that has ever been seen. And that relates to a theory that this series of murders was real, there was a real Ripper, but the only reason why is because Mary Kelly was the target of all of this. It was a series of murders that were committed so that people wouldn't figure out why Mary Kelly was the target, committing an additional series of crimes that were practically unrelated so no one would figure out what's really going on. Mary Kelly was a prostitute who was having an affair with Prince Eddie, and the royal family learned that she could have possibly been pregnant. They may have even had a secret marriage. That is another theory that is out there as well. So I would like to talk about some of the rebuttals to the Jack the Ripper hoax theory. That is one. I mean, most people form rebuttals to things like a hoax theory by simply providing an alternative and trying to share some ideas 
as to who actually committed a crime. Say, for example, if we could truly identify a Jack the Ripper suspect and there is some type of scientific breakthrough, well, then you might have something. But I would like to just go to casebook.org that talks about a rebuttal to this confession from Fred Best in 1931. In their 20th century memoir, senior police officials had publicly aired the belief that the Dear Boss letter was the creation of a London journalist. One was Robert Anderson and one was Melville McNaughton. It was not until 1966 that a possible name for the author first came to light. It was published in an article in the August edition of Crime and Detection, in which the author claims to have used a very spy and clear-minded 70-year-old ex-journalist named Fred Best as a contact in 1931, and that, as I said, not coming out until 1966 with the publication. Returning homewards with me, Best discussed the murders, the Whitechapel murders in particular, with much amplifying detail. He talked of his days as a penny-a-liner on the Star newspaper, as a freelance, and he had covered the Whitechapel murders from the discovery of Tabram. That's another one of the victims. He claimed that he and a provincial colleague were responsible for all the Ripper letters to keep the business alive. The possibility that Best and company were responsible for the Ripper letters is ludicrous, considering how many were sent and the various locations they were posted from. Oh yes, as I've already said, there are like 700 letters that have been attributed to Jack the Ripper, and of course, not all of those would be authentic, but I think you can get the idea where this rebuttal is coming from. In 2009, Andrew Cook published the name Frederick Best as the journalist in question. Although not included in the book, an alleged photograph of Best was shown in the accompanying TV documentary. On pages 102 to 106 of Cook's book, the findings were handwritten, except for Elaine Quigley's, which were shown from the Dear Boss letter and compared with the handwriting of Frederick Best. His example being written in the late 1890s, Quigley is quoted as saying, After careful consideration, I am as sure as I can be, I really do not think that it's anyone other than Best that wrote the Dear Boss letter. Cook also publishes a portion of a supposed letter from John Tomlinson Brunner to Harry Massingham, editor of the Star from 1890 to 1891, dated July 7, 1890, stating, Furthermore, Mr. Best's attempt to mislead Central News during the Whitechapel murders should have led to an earlier termination of his association with the newspaper. As to the identity of Frederick Best, journalist and author of the name, is recorded to have lived at 111 Stamford Street with his wife Henrietta. He was born in Westminster in 1858. He does not appear to show up on other records. I think if we had to put that article into one sentence one more time from casebook.org, is that they're accusing Fred Best of being a real person, but being a real liar all the same and saying he was doing that for years. But right now, let's just go over the two pieces of writing that have been attributed to Jack the Ripper that Fred Best would have claimed to have written. The first is the Dear Boss letter. Dear Boss, I keep on hearing the police have caught me, but they won't fix me just yet. I have laughed when they look so clever and talk about being on the right track. That joke about leather apron gave me real fits. I am down on whores and I shan't quit ripping them until I get buckled. Grand work the last job was. I gave the lady no time to squeal. How can they catch me now? I love my work and want to start again soon. You will hear of me with my funny little games. I saved some of the proper red stuff in a ginger beer bottle over the last job to write with, but it went thick like glue and I couldn't use it. Red ink is fit enough, I hope. Ha, ha. The next job I shall do is to clip the ladies' ears off and send them to the police. Just for jolly, wouldn't you? Keep this letter back till I do a bit more. Then give it out straight. My knife's so nice and sharp. I want to get to work right away. If I get a chance, good luck, yours, Jack the Ripper. Now let's partner that with the Saucy Jack postcard, the other one that Fred Bass claims to have written. I was not coddle, cutting, dear old boss, when I gave you the tip. You'll hear about Saucy Jackie's work tomorrow. Double event this time. Number one squealed a bit. Couldn't finish off straight. Had not time to get her ears off for the police. Thanks for keeping the last letter back. 
till I got to work again, Jack the Ripper. Okay, so I don't know about you guys, but I'm definitely noticing a major consistency. He is talking about the screams of the victims and providing a very solid explanation about why two victims were murdered in one night. Maybe the date had significance to him, maybe it didn't, or maybe he was just so determined on committing this crime that he tried to mutilate Long Liz Stride for a very specific reason, because he had told the police previously that he was going to, but she screamed and then someone came to that courtyard, as I said, so then the suspect just disappeared and was so frustrated that he very quickly found another victim, Catherine Eddowes, as quickly as possible. I mean, I can follow all of that in a narrative, but that's a thing, though. People can just stitch together facts in a narrative. The human brain is capable of that. Here is another point, though, that it's not even relevant to the Jack the Ripper hoax theory, but I notice that there are different types of voices in the letters, like there are different aspects of the personality that are shared, and I see the exact same ones in the Zodiac Killer mystery. The first is that there's this braggadocio who is like, I'm so smart, you won't catch me. I'm too good for you. That whole thing that Jack is saying in the first letter about, um, oh, my knife's so sharp, I'm laughing at the police because they think they're on the right track. And then there is this other voice, which is sharing details, intimate details of boring, mundane operations. Like with the Zodiac Killer, he would say, I got swamped out by the rain we had a while back. I was like, yeah, okay, that's a very valuable information you're sharing, dude. But then with um Saucy Jackie, and I shouldn't say that because it's in the Dear Boss letter. In the Dear Boss letter, Jack the Ripper is saying, oh yeah, I put some of her blood in the ginger beer bottle, but then it turned like glue, and it became, you know, too difficult to use. He is sharing this um, very simple, basic detail that is absolutely irrelevant to the murder. It just talks about trying to do something morbid and disgusting. It's almost that voice where there's this personality sharing things that he has no one else to talk about with. Is this actually from a journalist and a hoaxer? You know, it is possible. And here's one point, though that I did read. I think it's on whitechapeljack.com, but they said it's been so long that there is no way to lift DNA from the letters, and um, any type of DNA in that particular situation is just null and void. It is not going to be achieved. So that actually is um, somewhat of a shame. But on that note, I would like to go over to the book Naming Jack the Ripper. This is one that made the international news circuit back in 2014. It was something that a lot of people were talking about because somebody was claiming to have found DNA that had been left behind that he wanted to match to a particular suspect. And I believe Arid Kaminsky, the barber who was originally from Poland, was said suspect because back in those days, barbers would also have a high knowledge of surgery and anatomy. By that, I mean basic surgery but a high knowledge of anatomy all the same. And I'm just going to read the description here. After 125 years of theorizing and speculation regarding the identity of Jack the Ripper, Russell Edwards is in the unique position of owning the first physical evidence relating to the crimes that have emerged, that has emerged since 1888. This evidence is from one of the crime scenes and has now been rigorously examined by some of the most highly qualified forensic scientists in the country who have ascertained its true provenance. With the help of modern forensic techniques, Russell's groundbreaking discoveries provide conclusive answers to many of the challenging and mysterious mysterious aspects surrounding the case. And I believe the uh, evidence in question was a shawl that was taken from the murder of Catherine Eddowes, as I said, same night as the murder of Long Liz Stride, the quote-unquote double event. Now, I'm on Jack the Ripper dot, um, or I believe they said that not only did it have blood on it, but it also had semen. So, I mean, the narrative that they put forward was that one of the police officers had taken the shawl from the crime scene because he wanted to give it to his wife. 
I guess that didn't go through because apparently there's still DNA evidence left behind. And they're just um, postulating and pondering and just perplexed because they're saying, okay, times were hard in 1888, but if you're going to take a shawl from a murdered woman that could have blood and possibly semen on it, and you want to give that to anyone, let alone your wife? I mean, do you not like your wife or something like that? Hey, honey, I got this for you. Happy birthday. I mean, that's just kind of uh, disgusting and so on. But apparently they're saying that they could have matched some DNA. I don't necessarily think they were successful because... If we're going to have major breakthroughs in the true crime world, usually there's much more consensus and there's a higher understanding. Sometimes things might be a little bit too complicated for the general public to understand and digest. But with that particular um, book, Naming Jack the Ripper, I think that if they had more conclusive findings, then everybody would be talking about it and everybody would be like, no, there's no mystery anymore. They found the guy. So I have my doubts, and I definitely have my doubts about Aaron Kaminsky as a suspect. Okay, so on the one hand, we've talked about the Jack the Ripper hoax theory that it was created by the newspapers, particularly the Star, to try and um, generate some sensationalism to keep sales up. And then the rebuttal to that is that the people who say that they, say that they were involved with that hoax are not reliable, and also that other people think they have more credible suspects than the hoax theory. But because this episode is titled the way it is, I would like to go over to that BBC article that I found um, talking about how the Jack the Ripper letters could be a hoax. And this is, once again, from BBC.com. Jack the Ripper letters suggest newspaper hoax. Analysis of two famous letters ascribed to Jack the Ripper suggests that they were faked by journalists to boost the business. It has long been suggested that the two notes purported have been penned by the notorious Whitechapel killer and that they were hoaxes. New linguistic analysis focused on the Dear Boss letter and the Saucy Jackie postcard, both of which were received by the Central News Agency in 1888. It is found that a number of similarities pointed to a single author, and that is something else that I did read on all of the Jack the Ripper sites. People are mostly in consensus that the Saucy Jack postcard and the Dear Boss letter were written by the same person. Skillful works of fiction. By the way, skillful is spelled S-K-I-L-F-U-L. Intentional misspelling. His findings link the Dear Boss letter received by the agency on September 27th of 1888 in the first time that the name Jack the Ripper is used and then the Saucy Jackie postcard, which was received by the news agency four days later. Similarities include the use of saying to keep back instead of the more popular Victorian phrase to withhold, and the use of the word work as a euphemism for killing. Well, I mean, that's not really the most earth-shattering news, but I follow what you're saying. Both letters include ha-ha to depict laughter. Yeah, but they're not the only people who do. <laughs> that's not the only time the... Words ha-ha have been put together. Ha-ha-ha. How hot was he? During his research, the doctor also found links with a third epistle known as the Moab and the Midian letter forwarded to Scotland Yard. The most common theory suggests that the letters were a work of fiction skillfully created to generate shock and keep the business alive. According to historians on the Central News Agency, they face fierce competition and a reputation for embellishing news. So, um, this is something that's been reported on, and there are lots of people out there that think that either Jack the Ripper was a hoax and that it's just that, that the street gangs were mutilating these women because they weren't able to get what uh, they wanted from them, bribery, blackmail, they're trying to extort money out them, or they're trying to do something to them, like maybe getting certain privileges for free and she's refusing so then she's murdered and mutilated and it's about driving fear into the communities of London and uh, England and the entirety of the British Isles okay but that's just the underworld and that would mean that though they are women who are murdered by gangs not by a single serial killer who just wants to taunt the police and get off on that and I would like to go over to a different article from blog.oup.com, which talks about the possibility of the Ripper letters being a hoax. 
The receipt of these letters was perhaps not just a stroke of good luck. In all likelihood, the original two letters were in fact crafted by a journalist. A letter written by Detective Chief Inspector John George Littlechild famously wrote that the Dear Boss letter was a smart piece of journalistic work. If this is true, then the Jack the Ripper letters are probably the most successful case of fake news in history. Whoever was behind it created a fictional character that is still being commercially exploited, not too differently from other questionable works of fiction. If the theory is correct, then the real question is not who was Jack the Ripper, but who created Jack the Ripper. One theory connects the letters to a reporter called Frederick Best, who worked for one of the very first tabloids, The Star. Another theory comes from Inspector Little Child Self, who wrote that it was generally believed that at the yard that Tom Bullen of the Central News was the originator, but it is probable Moore was his chief, and he was the inventor. That's the uh, chief of the um, newspaper. The theory is quite credible, since the Central News Agency had a well-known habit for fabricating news. You can see all of this recreated in the 20th century with the San Francisco Chronicle and their exploitations of the Zodiac Killer. But this name, Tom Bullen, stands out because there's even this theory out there, if you dig far enough on the internet, that Fred Best and Tom Bullen were working together and they were in cahoots with this, and that Fred Best is going to write those two letters, the Dear Boss letter and the Saucy Jackie postcard, and the other stuff will be written by this guy, Tom Bullen. You will find that if you dig deeply enough. One of the contributions of forensic linguistic evidence is to settle a debate on whether the two letters were indeed written by the same author. Um, as I said, there really isn't too much of a debate about that, looking at the Saucy Jack postcard and the Dear Boss letter. Most people are in consensus about that. It's like other things, like the From Hell letter, that people do not seem to um, think are written by a different person. All right, but I will leave you with one thing about a suspect in the murder of Jack the Ripper named Leather Apron. Now, maybe I'm completely far out as somewhat of a newcomer to the Jack the Ripper mystery, but it seems like people are on the forums talking about this suspect named Leather Apron. That's a pseudonym that has been attributed to him. But when I had been reading up on this stuff, I thought that the Leather Apron was an original name for the serial killer that could be going around, and then Jack the Ripper is the one who is... um assigned himself the name, or maybe it's a hoax and that it was created by Tom Bullen and Fred Best, but I just noticed that people were referring to Leather Apron as an independent suspect. Now, is this what, like, the Murder Stories book was talking about, how the perception and the ideas behind these serial killer legends can evolve over time, even to the point where it gets supernatural? I don't really know, but I wanted to share some different things in this episode. Firstly, to talk about the reasons why some people think that the Ripper mystery is a hoax. And by hoax, they mean real murders happen, but someone was taking credit for murders that he didn't commit. And then, it also to provide some counter-arguments where some people think that that is absolutely ludicrous, and that um, there was a single perpetrator who was responsible for the crimes, and that um, the people who confessed to this, most notably Fred Bess, were unreliable. Not to mention, there is a clear narrative that has been established. What do you think about Jack the Ripper? And if you have a theory about who the Ripper was, I'm calling on all you Ripperologists who know this stuff better than me. Put your ideas down in the comments section below. One more time, you can visit Launchpad 1, the Teespring page, Amazon.com. But you can also write the show at BlackBoxOnlineRadio at AOL.com. There's a li there is the email address in the description box, as well as my personal Facebook, and it always BlackBoxNid88 on Instagram. And I'll see you over there for the bonus podcast. Until next time.